Buenos días y bienvenidos. Hola Cindy, ¿cómo estás? Muy bien. Tenemos una invitada muy especial el día de hoy, Sabrina González, está con nosotros. Y bueno, uh, estamos tomando mate. Muchas Así gracias, es. Sabrina. ¿Cómo estás? Buenos días, muy bien, muy bien. Arrancando el lunes. Así es, es lunes, febrero 17 del 2020. Un semestre bastante ocupado para todos, ¿verdad? Sabrina, estás de regreso, estuviste en Argentina, en tu país natal. Sí, muy contenta de meses. estar de vuelta y muy contenta de haber tenido la posibilidad de estar ahí haciendo un poco de investigación. Mm, we'll talk about that. Así es, así que vamos a dar inicio a esta entrevista. Sí. Sabrina González es a PhD candidate in the Department of History. She graduated from Universidad Nacional de la Matanza in Buenos Aires, Argentina with a BA in Social Communication. Her dissertation, entitled Schools as Laboratories, Science, Children's Bodies, and School Reformers in the Making of Modern Argentina, 1880 to 1930, studies the historical processes by which school teachers in South America used education as a tool for emancipation and built a transnational school reform movement that both challenged and contributed to children's discipline. In Argentina, she has taught multiple classes at public universities, high schools, and alternative schools for adults. Since 2006, she's been working with social movements as a communicator, educator, and student and labor organizer. Thank you for coming today. And, you know, we start this first part of the podcast, Relask, uh, asking, uh, who is Sabrina Gonzalez? Um, well, I think you did a good job introducing me. Uh, I am working in history of education. In uh, history, I... Um, I think I'm an educator, that's what I am, I teach, I love teaching, and I decided to do a PhD because of my engagement with, with teaching, basically, that's, that's the main reason. Uh, I, was, I became interested in history and archives after I decided that I wanted to go to grad school. I, uh, there were two main reasons that, um, that made me Uh, made that decision. The first one was uh, that I was already teaching in public universities in Argentina and I knew that uh, if I wanted to teach my own classes, if I wanted to teach in uh, advanced classes in the career, I I needed to have a, a, a PhD. And that, that was the, main, the one, one of them. And the other one was uh, really believing that Uh, social movements needed to have uh, organic intellectuals and people um, with uh, the tools that uh, grad school give us and that education give us uh, in order to uh, um, in I don't know in order to change the world I guess in, yeah. in very broad terms. <laughs> yeah. So I was sorry. I was teaching in um, in an alternative school uh, for adults in in Buenos Aires when I decided to do my master. And at some point, I get to uh, that realization that uh, that social movements need more more activists with with those type of tools. And then I decided to start my masters in. Uh, I'm a coursework in Buenos Aires, mm. in history, and I changed from communication to history, I guess because I only wanted to do history, but I, uh, when I was 17 or so, I didn't want to be a teacher, and I thought if I'm going to study history uh, as a BA, I'm, I'm going to end up in a classroom, and that's not what I want. And I was interested in journalism and sports. Can you believe it? Sports. <laughs> and, and I started communication for that reason. And then in my third year, I discovered that I wanted to be an educator for the rest of my life. And that's why I decided to finally pursue history and, pursue history. and do what I always wanted to do. Amazing. So how did you discover that you wanted to become a teacher? So I was working, no working, I was, um, I guess volunteering is the verb that you, that you use in English, although it's, it, it, What's in Spanish? When, uh, 
I guess I would say I estaba militando. Okay. Like we, we use the verb militar mm. as uh, as being an activist. Uh, but I don't think you have that you don't have a verb in English to being an activist. Right? You're right. Uh, I mean, so, you can say you're an, an activist. You're an activist. Yeah, but you don't have counter, the verb, no, no. no. I think it, I think it has a different kind of meaning also. Well, militando, Culturally. I guess militant in English it refers more to the more kind of guerrilla or yeah. armed activism. While in Argentina we refer as militantes as cultural and social workers or right. uh, activists as well. So. Um, what I was saying, so I was an activist in this uh, group that uh, made documentaries and it was inside the commu communications uh, major and at some point we decided that we wanted to do something else than um, tell cool stories mm -hmm. and that we wanted to uh, engage with the actual people and real uh, issues that were affecting the local communities outside outside the university. Uh, so we decided that we wanted to um, start collaborating with different uh, organizations and social movements. Um, one of the things that we did was uh, collaborating with a toma, I don't know how to say that in English, a toma de tierras, right? So there was a group of people uh, tomando tierras para, para vivir en sus hogares. Yeah, I guess that, that would be the, the word. So we used, so the, we, we uh, helped them, we accompanied them throughout the whole process of the toma. That was a very dangerous one uh, because they, there was a lot of risk that the police and gendarmería was uh, trying to kick them. Uh, so we used our cameras as a tool for them to be more uh, protected, right? Mm. So uh, those, and then we created a documentary, but through the process of the toma itself, it was a tool for them to feel that they were not alone. And if the pol the, there was police repression or something like that, uh, they knew that, that we had a camera and that story was uh, uh, was being told uh, after that. So that was one of the things that we did. And then another um, one union, uh, El Sindicato de Canillitas, that is the, the workers that sells newspapers, um, um, were, they were starting a Bachillerato Educación Popular, which is this uh, popular education, I guess, alternative school to uh, the state uh, for adults in um, in a working class neighborhood for for, stu for adults to finish high school. And I volunteered to be one of the one of the. Um, I think at that point was communication or linguistics or like uh, language, something like that was, uh, and yeah, and it was a great experience because first I had all the possibilities to be creative and to do with my teaching something different. Um, second, I had no idea what I was doing and that was okay because it was an experimental school in a way, so you feel less pressure to do certain things. Um, it was a collective experience as well because I was teaching with uh, with another friend and activist from my group, so uh, that was uh, kind of unique in the alternative school to the state when you have uh, what we call pareja pedagogica. No, I like it pedagogical partner, or partner. Like partnership yeah. or, or something like that. And that's good because you plan the class with your colleague, you teach with your colleague, then we have the methodology of taking notes uh, during the class as a kind of as a journal, as a register to see what worked, what didn't work. And then even with the students, we have assemblies to discuss what they wanted to, uh, what what they wanted to that class, what they wanted from that school. Mm -hmm. uh, we discuss, we collectively discuss with the students their grades. Uh, so it was it was a really. Sorry? Flexible. Yeah, flexible, but also really hard because we, we tended to reproduce a lot of things that we knew, uh, learned by by uh, formal um, school. Uh, and then we, but yeah, we had the opportunity to learn a lot. Uh, and yeah, and then I decided, oh my God, I want to be a teacher. Uh, that that was that was really a really fascinating uh, moment in my life, and I discovered that I want yeah I want to be in front of the classroom and teach. 
So how do you combine um, activism in class while you're teaching? In class? Mm -hmm. hmm. I guess here in, in UMD, what I did a lot was uh, guest lectures and to teach about social movements in Latin America. So I've been, uh, or I participated in different in different ways, not only as a guest lecturer, in classes about um, movimientos in tierra in Brazil, ni una menos in Argentina, um, a factories run and recovered by the workers. So a lot, a lot of, in terms of content, I guess it's important to uh, teach that uh, all the experiences of struggle and resistance and basically organizations that that we have in in South America, at least is what I, I, I've been teaching um, uh, most here in the States. And then, um, th so that, that I guess that answered your question in terms of the contents, but then you have uh, in terms of methodology. So what about how we how we introduce these methodologies of discussion uh, inside the classroom? But for me, it's important that students gain um, confidence in uh, in raising their hand, raising their voices, in, uh, in even um, organized against something that they consider that is uh, that is uh, that can be changed mm -hmm. even inside the classroom. Um, so I try to promote spaces of discussion that uh, um, that promotes leadership inside the classroom, right? So I always pro um, uh, and tell them that they need to figure it out who is going to be a moderator, mm -hmm. basically who is going to be distributing the word to make sure that everyone uh, talks inside the inside the group, mm -hmm. uh, who is going to be the um, the spoke person who is going to represent the group. So trying to promote, uh, yeah, like methodologies of discussion, I guess, and methodologies of organization. That's that's one thing. And then um, try to um, use different methodologies that that uh, developed in uh, popular education uh, pedagogies or popular or alternative schools methodologies. Uh, that is. You know that is hard to implement sometimes because as a as a woman in front of a classroom, sometimes you also need to gain. Uh, it seems the only way to gain uh, respect and for the students to believe that oh, you are an authoritative voice or teacher. You need to do the things that they expect that you're. You know they expect you to do because that's how education works that's how power works that's how authority works uh, so it's hard to dismantle those notions of authority inside the classroom and promote more horizontal conversation between students and teachers at the same time uh, i am not at the same time i gain uh respect from them right like I, I, is it clear what i'm saying yeah, so it's like yeah. the, 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 like the 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 no sé como las dificultades de um, de ser una mujer en frente de un aula y, y las dificultades que tiene una mujer a veces de innovar también, ¿no? Como de, de bueno, quiero mostrarles estas metodologías que son cool y quiero demostrarles que eh, creo en la horizontalidad y que tenemos que desarrollar este tipo de metodologías adentro del aula, pero al mismo tiempo eh, cómo, cómo lidiar con todos los prejuicios que los estudiantes pueden llegar a tener también a, bueno, qué se supone que tengo que hacer eh, como autoridad y por otro lado really being really aware that there are relationships of power that that um, no matter how much I want to create horizontal spaces inside the classroom there are hierarchies and and the, at the end of the semester at the end of the day is the is the professor is the teaching assistant uh, is the educator the one who decide uh, your grade classifies you, right? You know, in that's something that I that I'm uh, reading a lot of my sources from the beginning of the 20th century. Grades, uh, uh, instead of uh, notas, which is how mm -hmm. we call it in Argentina today, they were uh, called um, classification, classification, right? And that's exactly what a grade does 
does in front the, it classifies students in categories from the best to the worst and uh, I guess while what I need to teach and I will need to tell them students is that I uh, disagree with that system. Mm -hmm. I think that system has been created to discipline uh, student bodies inside the classroom and to and has been created in a very uh, static way that doesn't acknowledge many different type of knowledges, many different uh, life experiences, uh, stories that has been neglected in the official curricula. Uh, but on the other hand, we are in we are in the system. I'm I'm here to tell you that this is uh, wrong, <laughs> but also I am reproducing this uh, this same system that I I distrust. That you disagree with. Uh, so yeah, that's the contradiction that I face every day. <laughs> like while I try to do whatever you ask me, uh, like how how I do this, I don't know. So Sarina, kind of going back a little bit on, on sort of the you know, before the research and how perhaps you end up here. Thank you so much. Delicious mate, by the way. <laughs> um, how do you end up here, you know? And um, and also you can tell us a little bit about what you did this past semester and a half. Um, I, I don't know how I end up here. I guess there are many. You just <laughs> woke up one day and here she is. Uh, no, I guess I guess the process of uh, being uh, taking classes in my master program in Buenos Aires, I, I became really interested in 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 exploring other ways of uh, another world of, of teaching and, and and doing research. Um, I guess I've been always fascinated by the possibility of traveling and, and go to different places and experiencing and for sure uh, taking into account uh, the material possibilities that Latin American universities and in particular Argentine universities and, and the whole system of funding research, taking into account how that works versus how uh, it works here. Definitely in the uh, global north there are more funding opportunities so it is a, um, it is a fact that that at some point uh, if you are looking uh, you know to travel to international conferences to do research uh, in different countries to do something like a transnational history that I'm doing here you also need to travel not, not only to visit the National Archives but also travel to other countries so it is a uh, it, that, that was one of the reasons, right? Okay. I wanted to travel, I wanted to see new things. I was a little bit uh, tired of, of Buenos Aires at one point. I wanted to Change. explore other things. My partner is from here also, and I think I would never, I would have never ended up in the US. Uh, otherwise. We, otherwise, yeah. yeah. Um, but that, that was a big, and that was a big factor. And then what I was doing last semester was going back to Argentina and do research in the National Archives and in the National Library. I also went to an uh, historic archive of uh, one of the, uh, the, the most important uh, normal school in the period that I study, a uh, normal school where, where uh, teachers uh, were, uh, were being taught to be teachers. Um, so, yeah, I was I was in part being uh, uh, finishing my my research to try writing my dissertation this semester. That was one of the things, and then the experiential knowledge, which is always important too. I was enjoying um, um, a very uh, let me let me see how I can put it uh, a feminist environment in Buenos Aires. Uh, I had the opportunity to participate for the first time in my life uh, in the women's gathering. Uh, Encuentros Nacional de Mujeres is a um, it's an it's a gathering that uh, has been happening for more than thirty years now, and it's um, it was a one of the most important experiences, uh, like political experiences, uh, being in the street with so many, so many people. And so basically, if I can tell you a little bit about the, about the gathering and Absolutely. how it works. Um, so you, you, you can go by your own or you can go with an organization. 
uh, like more organically, right? I went with an organization, um, las compañeras de Mala Junta, um, that are like, they are part of the collective, uh, of the movement Patria Grande. And so the whole experience of being in the in the encuentro, it, it, it kind of starts before actually being there because you start meeting with the compañeras and you start talking about what is going to happen, what are the security measures, what you know clothes you need to take there, like what do you need? It's three days. You um, sometimes you do some uh, we did some rifas to uh, gather money to buy uh, to buy. Um, the, ¿cómo se dice? Como la inscripción, right? To pay for the registration for those the compañeras who couldn't, uh, who couldn't afford, it. afford it. So it's it's a whole organizational experience before you are actually there. Uh, so once you are there, it's a three day, it's a, a three day gathering. And you have two days or one day and a half of workshops. Uh, the workshops are um, like really, they can really, if you look at it as a, as a source, uh, it really tells you to what extent this movement is uh, like really rethinking every single aspect of society from sports to uh, sexualities to uh, labor and, and many, many things. So you pick what workshop you want to participate. Uh, and you can, and there are three sections of each workshop uh, in the morning, in the afternoon, and then the following day. And then you together write uh, or discuss the conclusions that are published after the end of each uh, gathering. And then there are two, two march, two protests. Uh, the big one is on, uh, is the second day and is, uh, is, is the, la, la protesta, la marcha de, del encuentro. Um, and the other one one has been recently incorporated is um, by the LG, uh, las comunidades LGBT, pero específicamente las eh, los activistas trans eh, que han sido muy muy activos en los últimos años en eh, visibilizar las violencias de género y las violencias y los travesticidios. Entonces, en los últimos eh, en los últimos años esa marcha formó parte is now uh, again part of the uh, the formal uh, schedule of the of the gathering uh, and is uh, it has been a protest against uh, travesticidios um, among other things um, so it's, it's so you have you have not only protests and workshops uh, you also have a bunch of uh, cultural activities concerts um, uh, like theory performance a uh, book lounge um, round tables it's mm -hmm. it's a party so the whole city is como que estuviera tomada right and you have tents uh, all over the place and inside the tents you have uh, the, the activities that each social movement or each political party is promoting and then you have the workshops inside the, in the universities in general in, in university classrooms and then the protest of course in the street and then the last day you uh, go to the closing event and you vote when it, the next uh, gathering is going to happen um, so that was that was amazing and I was crying for three days basically <laughs> because it was so moving all the time for different reasons. So what issues women encounter in Argentina that differs from the US? Oh <clears throat> that's a hard question. Um I I think taking into account the the emergence of the of the fourth wave with quotes and quote we can we can I mean there, there are many many reasons why uh, scholars here don't want to engage with the terms of wave that is a very uh, that implies a very um, kind of from north to south uh, uh, idea of uh, how 
activism and how feminism should be is this uh, idea of white uh, nor, like, white feminism imposed in uh, like that that have erased other history longer histories of oppression for example here in the US uh, from uh, black feminists or Chicana feminists or indigenous feminism so um, so the term wave in itself is is um, is problematic but uh, many Argentines in in Argentina many feminists are are saying uh, that they are part of the fourth way, la cuarta ola, right? And they they are even using now other other metaphor that is marea. Um, so it's still an oceanic uh, metaphor, uh, but it's a it's a different one, and at least it's not it's not the one of way. So okay, all this to say, <laughs> what uh, what is this uh, or when this uh, this uh, marea? Uh, started. I think it started in 2015 with uh, the movement with Nuna Menos. Um, and so, if we take that into account, if we if we think that that genealogy, that 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 moment, it's key to understand uh, Argentine feminism today, then the what is highlighted, what is the most important aspect, is is violence. Mm. And I guess uh, then um, I I don't know if I'm not saying for sure that women uh, does not experiment violence in the U.S. No, that's not what I'm saying. But I think the way violence is permeated in everyday life mm -hmm. in Latin American women is 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 different. The the feeling uh, of uh, fear, the feeling of of you know like. Um, thinking every day what you're going to wear because I'm going to yeah. because I'm, I'm walking in the streets or what uh, yeah it's it's uh, so when in 2015 I think the rate uh, the ratio in that moment were one woman being killed every 24 hours or 16 hours or so I mean the numbers changed and have changed uh, I guess um, yeah, we can discuss about the statistics and how how are being uh, formed. But the fact is that let's say what uh, one woman is being killed every day in Argentina um, by uh, their partners in general. Um, the 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 risk and the main um, threat is inside their like the intimate uh, circles, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's a key component um, of why women are are organized today against against gender violence. And then it started with and it became also a, como un resurgimiento y un definitivamente como un empoderamiento muy grande en relación a la despenalización del aborto. Mm. Um, la campaña por la Por la legalización del aborto en Argentina tiene eh, décadas. It's not legalized. It's not legal. No. Oh. No, no, no. No, it's not legal. And not only that, many women uh, who can afford a, uh, a, a clandestine but safe abortion, meaning uh, women who are not in the middle of uh, in the middle class uh, or they, they they can afford this. Um, Sometimes they go to the hospital after having a clandestine abortion in their homes, or even sometimes even having a spontaneous abortion without knowing that that was happening, mm. and they are being uh, interrogated by by medical uh, staff. And they um, many times women go from the hospital where they are being uh, taken care of, kind of, to uh, the prison mm. because someone in that in, in between called the police. And 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 the denuncian, and that is so that that's also how violence is operating in um, not only violence in in the sense of you know my my partner is uh, is beating me partner with quote unquote, um, but my. Uh, but I can I can access to uh, reproductive <laughs> reproductive yeah, rights. Yeah. Um, so violence like very deeply institutionalized in the within the state, in our families, in the schools, in uh, the universities. Um, that is uh, affecting women in 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 many different ways. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good question. Oh, yeah, good answer. But um, tying it back with your study abroad, um, 
So you, so yeah, you you're putting together uh, this next summer. Yes. A study abroad <laughs> class with uh, another friend, also and part of the community here, uh, Katia Snyder, Dr. Snyder, and you're going to Argentina for a couple of weeks, right? Mm. And then you put together this uh, curriculum. Yeah, so the study abroad started, uh, it started one night, you know, it, um, Kara was uh, thinking about a project for um, uh, inside women's studies and uh, she called me and she's like you know I want to do this study abroad and I think this is uh, this is something that I want to do with you and this is something that we should do in Buenos Aires and I was really into it the first second I was like yes let's do it <laughs> and uh, then you know there are many bureaucratic and administrative um, uh, barriers when you try to do something as a grad student mm -hmm. and but then there is also uh, the the hope and the strength that that things that needs to happen are going to happen mm -hmm. so when there were barriers I told Kara Kara this is happening we are doing it let's figure it out how to do it and we are going to do it so it started in April of May as a dream and it became um, a real thing. We are now recruiting students for the study abroad uh, in Argentina uh, called Women's Movements for Justice. Uh, we are uh, we were debating a lot about the name too because why we should name women. That's that's something that I didn't mention, but that's a big debate in Argentina right now regarding um, who is the subject who is going to mm. be at the forefront of the feminist revolution. Are they women or are they also what we call dissidencias? No. It's so uh, part of the, the, the big debate that are happening and that was happening during the last uh, women's gathering is the two. First, to uh, change the name from national women's gathering to plurinational because it's not only about Argentine women, it's also about indigenous women, it's also about uh, other Latin American uh, nationalities and women that are, that are uh, part of the Argentine feminist movement, right? right? So that's one of the things. And the other one is why, why we need to call it women's gathering, why we can open the, uh, the name and the definition and the, uh, the, the agenda, if you want, to the, um, uh, many identities mm -hmm. uh, that are part of this movement. So the the um, name um, or the debate now is to change uh, the gathering from Encuentro Nacional de Mujeres to Encuentro Plurinacional de Mujeres Lesbianas, Trans y Disidencias Sexuales. So it was a huge deal how how we are going to call this study of our program this the, the kind of theoretical conversations about about um, feminist uh, practice feminist praxis but also very uh, you know on the ground very very um, current debates among activists mm -hmm. so going back to the study abroad we are uh, spending there three weeks and we are doing uh, not only teaching and, and reading about about uh, feminist theory and feminist praxis and uh, women's movements in Argentina but also uh, engaging with social movements partnering with two local universities there public universities which I think it's important and our program is different than other programs um, that are run in in Argentina as well, in part because I believe it's very important that students have the opportunity to uh, attend a class in a public university. Uh, it's not the same to go to Buenos Aires. Many times uh, they want to sell Buenos Aires as the most European Latin American city. Mm -hmm. And that's how colonized we are, right? Like we need to sell a Latin American study abroad program as is, you know, you're going to actually uh, to Latin America, but actually it's, a, it's more European. Um, so don't worry. <laughs> It's, it's, it's safer, it's whiter, mm. it's more, it's, you know, it's closest to your uh, yeah, experience. Mm. And I, while on one hand, of course, we can't deny um, Buenos Aires um, history of immigration, for sure, Argentina received 
uh, is, is one of the Latin American countries who received more European immigration at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, for sure, that's 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 real. That's part of our history. I I believe there is uh, is like it's very tricky to sell to sell a program in Buenos Aires by only showing the students uh, the touristic places and the right. nice things at Buenos Aires. There are like many as any other country. There are many beautiful and and uh, wonderful things that you can do, especially if you have dollars and you are going to a country. Uh, that is going through a huge economic crisis, right? We are the third country, I guess, with more inflation in the world. So yes, <laughs> there are many there are many privileged ways in which you can enjoy Buenos Aires right now if you have dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I think is important um, from a pedagogical and political perspective is that the students a um, being like are in contact with 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 real people, with real issues affecting working class people, uh, and they are connected with uh, histories of oppression that might not be familiar uh, to them, but are connected because mm -hmm. um, because women experimented uh, violence in different ways, even at least as a as a way of, of comparing uh, the different ways in which. Um, El patriarcado nos mata y nos afecta a todas, a todos. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's the inspiration of this of this study abroad is definitely these uh, women who are now fighting for the legalization of abortion, who are now fighting in the streets and in their homes, in the classrooms, uh, in the universities, in the factories to uh, to be uh, equal, I guess, or mm -hmm. finally. <laughs> Uh, equal. So we wish you all the luck with the study abroad program. I know it'll be amazing. If anyone wants to join, we will add the description and the link of the, um, the how program. Do I apply. Yeah, absolutely. And so I just want to just take a pause on, on, on your research and, and that. And I just want to thank you again for coming and, and being part of this interview. And also to thank you for um, for all the work that you have done to LASC. Um, a lot of people don't might not know this, but Sabrina was a graduate assistant here at LASC for a, a number of years. Three years. Three years. <laughs> and during that time, I landed here as a coordinator for the Latin American Center, and she was my mentor. Mm -hmm. Everything that I know, it's because of Sabrina, so thank you for oh, that. That's and we, de <laughs> we develop a good relationship, a friendship. Um, so tell us a little bit about your, your time here at LASC. Um, you know, what maybe this somehow the experience at this center um, influenced a little bit your research uh -huh. um, etc please <clears throat> yeah well when I, I came here in 2015 um and for me, last was, you know, first of all, was the only opportunity to be funded and to be here, so I wouldn't be studying here uh, otherwise. So um, that was my last for sure has been in the last couple of years and, and a, a in, incredible source of, of funding for a graduate student who uh, didn't get funding from the home department. So that's, that's one of the so that's that's an incredible huge mission that LASK is doing here. Uh, only for once you and hopefully in the future the authorities in this university um, understand what LASK is and represents for many uh, Latinx uh, students and Latin American and, and, and scholars working on Latin America and the Caribbean too uh, and, and give us the possibility of having another TA, another GA, which is something that we uh, used to have in the past. But when I was here, I was the only GA and I guess what I enjoy the most and I want, what I learn uh, here is um, well, I learned that that um, that I could create something from from almost nothing, which from is from scratch. Uh, <laughs> which is uh, it was it's a, it's a it was a very powerful uh, 
como lesson, ¿no? Yeah. Um, so I, I came here and I, I was very surprised that the way, um, I was very shocked by the lack of, of uh, collective something like I don't know like collect not only collective bargaining in terms of, of um, our rights but a collective uh, like something like a community where you can you know share your work uh, so part of the things that I've been trying to do as, as a GA here was really working hard in creating a community of grad students who work together towards and the planification of a conference or um, engage in each other's work through uh, the writing group that is now um that is still uh, still uh, working in in Lask. So these are the I want to say these are the two main uh, things or projects that I engage with. I engage with also uh, teaching uh, in the Latin American study uh, classes and uh, mentoring undergraduates through the mentor uh, mentorship program. So I've been pretty much involved in anything that has been happening in Lask around the grad student community. And I, I think we are doing an, an Anna's uh, Anna Mendes work as a GA was uh, wonderful in um, maintaining momentum, in uh, growing in organization, in promoting new new things, uh, as she promoted the uh, creation of the Graduate Student Collective uh, last year. So I, um, so that 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 has been. Uh, pretty much my experience of being at LASK and you know learning uh, from other countries I guess this is uh, if, if we want to wrap up with the interview this is a good time to uh, think what is Latin America I know this is what you wanted to exactly. talk about exactly I wanted to hear what is Latin America <laughs> because I think what I learned from the center is precisely that the complexities of even uh, talking or thinking about that term I, you know I uh, was how I, I think I was 27, 28 when I came here, and I never, I never ever did, I lived in um, in another country. I always lived inside Buenos Aires, like really close to my family, to my friends, you know, like this very uh, Argentina, even Latin experience. American experience, right? Like you don't come, you don't move that much as here in the U.S. And I came here and I discovered, you know, all these tastes, tastes, tastes. Sabores, like flavors, flavors from Latin America, <laughs> and then uh, and the, you know the different ways of pronouncing things or um, mm -hmm. um, the different type of the Spanish uh, speakers, the way we even conceive uh, the world and how we are seeing the same things but seeing different different things at the same time and. So I guess the center and being here in the U.S. in general enriched my understanding of what is Latin America and how can even how can we even think about something as Latin America as one category when it's so complex and so yeah. rich and it has uh, different trajectories of Spanish colonization and Portuguese colonization, different uh, development of uh, the labor movement, different um, moments of industrialization. And 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 I understand there are there are some similarities and some attempts to to uh, you know homogenize that, but uh, but I think what the center gave me and what we can learn from here is precisely the richness of of our history. Um, and our histories of resistance and 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 resilience. That was amazing. That was <laughs> well, thank you, thank you for being here. That was amazing. I learned so much, and hopefully, our viewers will learn something as well. 
absolutely well again thank you so much for coming i hope we can have you on a next time mm -hmm. next episode we can probably dig more into your research um, also an update with the study abroad with the study abroad exactly so we'll keep the information mm -hmm. uh a link uh in the description and any final thoughts or any advice uh no, to no, our community? Just, i guess uh thank you for inviting me uh, and congratulations uh cindy and eric for this wonderful project um this is a so needed project in terms of the digital humanities project so last is being uh updated and also in terms of the stories that needs to be told it's right. very need to be told it's very important uh that that we have a record of the people who has been uh you know like who, la gente que pasó por las so thank you so much for that project i'm i'm as a, a communications major i'm really <laughs> excited uh of like to see where where this amazing project uh goes in the future so thank you thank you so much Thank you for that, Mate. <laughs> this podcast was brought to you by the Latin American Study Center at the University of Maryland. Please follow us on social media and don't forget to play the next podcast. Thank you and vemos.